So thank you all for attending today's environmental ethics seminar. Um, I know some of you are here out of necessity for being enrolled in the environmental ethics seminar class, but um, everyone else is here out of um, choice other than uh, we have some other students that are, that are here for a class as well. So welcome um, to this uh, joint class session as well as um, public seminar because we have a lot of attendees that are that are tuning in remotely and um, and are just interested to hear tonight's talk. So these, in case you don't know, these seminars that are um, hosted by the Environmental Ethics Certificate Program are held every semester. We usually have somewhere between four and five um, seminars each semester. In addition to other events that are hosted by the Environmental Ethics Certificate Program um, each semester as well. But the, the seminars are um, an integral part of the certificate itself. Um, the certificate was started back in 1983 as a, a joint effort between uh, the uh, Inst Institute of Ecology and the philosophy department. So Eugene Odom and Frederick Ferre were two of the, um, the initial um, organizers of the Environmental Ethics Certificate Program. It was the first of its kind in the United States back in the early 1980s. And, um, you know, proud to have it still going strong here today. Certainly the issues that we're dealing with are um, as relevant as the environmental issues uh, that we're, we were facing in the 1980s, maybe even uh, more urgent today than, than ever before. Um, some of the upcoming events that we do have, we have two more seminars remaining this semester. We also have a, um, a philosopher's walk. It's basically a guided hike. That'll be at the Odom uh, Broad River property, which is actually managed by the Odom School of Ecology today. And then we'll be hosting a screening of the film Garbage Warriors um, as a, an outdoor screen on the green at the Founders Garden at the, towards the end of this month. So information about all of those events can be found on the Environmental Ethics Certificate Program website, which is embedded within the College of Environment and Design website. And I hope you can all just Google that and find it. It's, it's pretty easy to find, but, we've, um, but please do you know, keep tabs on that. We've got great events every semester. Um, as I briefly mentioned, it's been tradition that these seminars are open to the general public. So I suspect that a lot of our attendees that are tuned in remotely are perhaps not even here in Athens and um, are here joining us uh, from all over the, the region and, and the country. And that's been actually one of the silver linings of this whole hybrid uh, you know, kind of thing we've had to get used to is we've been able to open these up to a much broader audience than just what we have here, in, um, here on campus, which has been a lot of fun. So folks on tuned in remotely, um, we can't see you, but, um, but towards the end of the talk, when we do open it up for Q&A, if you do have questions, you can type it into either the chat or the Q&A feature in here, and I'll um, try to come up and, and keep tabs on that and, and read those aloud or, um, or you know, in some other way, uh, get those across. Um, so keep that in mind. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our um, special guest tonight, Holly Hayworth. And uh, Holly and I met last semester uh, through a mutual friend, Janice Ray. Some of you were probably here for her book signing that she did. And um, when I met Holly and got to know the work that she's doing as an environmental journalist and essayist, and the work that she's done that has been featured in New York Times Magazine, Orion, uh, Latin's Quarterly, Sierra, Oxford American, the Utney Reader, and so many uh, other venues. I was blown away that we hadn't met previously and, and thought what a, what a great uh, person to invite to the environmental ethics seminars. Um, her work has also been included in the Best American Science and Nature Writing and, um, and listed uh, as notable in the Best American Travel Writing. And she's a recipient of the Middlebury Fellowship in Environmental Journalism and working on a book a field guide to listening. And uh, so this evening, Holly's gonna be talking about her approach to writing about unique landscapes and places through immersion, reporting and research. And that's something really important to me. I know, uh, you know a lot of uh, courses in the landscape architecture program where, where I teach um, really focus on immersing ourselves in the landscape and being good observers of the landscape. So I'm really excited to hear about some of her work tonight and her techniques for developing a strong sense of place-based writing practice. I know some of the students that are in Holly's class are, are learning about that you know, throughout the entire semester, but we're thrilled to get a little bit of that tonight. So without further ado, welcome Holly. Thank you for being here.
thank you so much. I hope I can live up to that introduction. Meanwhile, hello everyone, and thank you for being here this evening, and thank you all um, also who are tuning in online. Um, it's really an honor to be here at the College of Environment and Design. Um, thank you to the college, to the Environmental Ethics Certificate Program, and thank you, Dr. Vic, for inviting me to speak tonight about writing the environment. Um, so, um, so I'd first like to pause um, to acknowledge that this land that we're on was cared for and tended to by the Creek people who were known as the Oconee here for many centuries, <clears throat> which is now the name of the river that runs just downhill of this building. Um, and before the Creeks, the people now known as the Mound Builders who lived here for millennia. And I want to give gratitude to all the people who lived here before and cared for this place. Um, which also included black slaves who farmed this land. And as I give this acknowledgement, um, which is so glancing and incomplete, I'm reminded that every place contains long and complex histories of inhabitants that have shaped it and continue to shape it. I'm also compelled to reach farther back to acknowledge that these histories of inhabitants predate the human species by millions of years and even billions beyond our human conception so that I might also thank the stars, the sun, volcanoes, fires, lightning, cataclysmic earth-making forces, the wind, photosynthesizing cyanobacteria and algae that prepared a breathable atmosphere for us, lichens, fungi, the trees and plants that built this soil that we walk on, the rain that fell that created the river, and all the animals that have lived um, and died here in proliferation. Uh, thinking back into that long, long, deep time history, acknowledging that what we call the environment, um, which simply means that which surrounds us, is a great and unspeakable, unknowable mesh of forces and agents that the environmental philosopher David Abram calls the more than human world. That's a term that I love. So we begin from this place, always as writers of the environment, begin with this act of decentering ourselves, which is also paradoxically a way of coming home and of coming into inhabitants uh, wherever we are. I'd like to suggest here that writing the environment is an act and a gesture toward our own belonging. Perhaps the human belief um, that has been most harmful to the environment, we might say, is that humans are separate from nature. The story of separation that tells us that we don't belong here, that we're more special, and that's a thread that runs through our entire education system our government through fields of medicine, technology, business, and it even runs through the American conservation movement in a way um, in the idea that nature is best, um, is at its best when humans aren't present. So writing the environment begins with decentering ourselves. While it's also important that it works toward an acknowledgement of our own belonging and poses questions about how we might better, more wisely belong, aware of the innate intelligence of the more than human world that not only surrounds us, but upholds us and enables our lives. 
I'd like to suggest here that this belonging is a practice and that storytelling is our tool. So that's where I come in. <laughs> um, so uh, when Dr. Vic asked me to give a talk on writing the environment, it caused me to um, reflect on my own path into this work. And so I thought I would begin with a, um, a sort of an origin story, um, which is also an incomplete one and has a lot of omissions. But I thought it would be an interesting part of this talk just to um, share the path that brought me here, some of it. Um, so... So the first big gap in the story for um, purposes of our time today um, is a 19 year one. <laughs> so omitting my childhood in East Tennessee, um, I began working as a copy editor at my college's independent student run daily newspaper at the University of Tennessee Knoxville when I was 19 and a sophomore in college. I couldn't find a picture from that time, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can just imagine it. Within about um, six months, I became the chief copy editor and the following year, I was offered the position of the arts and entertainment editor. So I was writing about music primarily. I was an avid music fan and I started covering every show in Knoxville that I possibly could. Um, if you know Knoxville at all, if you're tuning in from Knoxville right now, which you might be, um, you know it's a major music city of the Southeast. So I had a lot of opportunity to write about music and I began following um, sort of the rock and roll journalist uh, career path. Um, when I graduated, I got an internship at Paste Magazine based in Atlanta um, at that time. It was, a, it was a major music magazine in the ranks with um, magazines like Spin and Rolling Stone. Um, and this is the paste offices there. Um, but um, at a certain point there at Paste, writing about music, covering shows in Atlanta, um, interviewing bands and um, all of that, um, I remember applying for a position at National Geographic and I remember I put everything into my application and I, I didn't get the job. Um, so when my internship was over at Paste, I moved back to Knoxville. I kept covering music there, um, but something was just tugging on me. Um, I decided to join AmeriCorps and move to rural New Mexico to teach um, in environmental education. Um, I, um, and this is Ruidoso, the town is, um, they are just in the gap in the trees there. I lived on that mountain. Um, so that's looking down on the uh, very small town, um, right at the edge of the Mescalero Apache Reservation in the high desert Ponderosa Pine forest ecosystem. Um, and I was responsible for implementing an after-school environmental education program there. Um, I really enjoyed that, and I also, um, I also just felt like I didn't know what I was doing with my life. <laughs> that might be a common uh, thing, um, and especially for young people. Um, um, I hadn't really heard that environmental education was uh, really a thing, um, something that people did with their lives. And I am sort of conflating environmental education and environmental writing. I feel that they have intertwined for me um, quite a bit. Um, but so, and I also hadn't gotten the job at National Geographic. And I thought, you know, I thought, okay, that's not my path. Um, and I did sort of think that was the only path into this kind of writing and this kind of work. Um, but I also began writing little articles for the local newspaper um, 
about work that the nonprofit was doing. We were partnering with the Apache tribe on water quality issues. And I would take my students, this is a picture um, of my students. Um, uh, I would take them to the, um, to the fish hatchery, the Mescalero uh, fish hatchery. And so I started writing about those things um, that we were involved in and that we were doing. Um, for the for the local newspaper there in Ruidoso, New Mexico, um, and this is my uh, this is my coworker Kai T here on this photo on the left. Um, he was he is a Coach T Puebloan tribal member. I was really lucky in the beginning of my path to environmental writing, um, which I didn't know at that time, of course, that that was the path I was on. Um, but, um, I, looking back, I was very lucky to, um, know and to witness Kai T, his knowledgeable perspectives about how colonization and racial oppression is intertwined with the exploitation of the land, um, and with resource extraction. The Coach T Pueblo, where Kai T, uh, grew up is downstream of Los Alamos, one of the sites where the atomic bomb was developed, um, along with Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is near where I'm from. And I got to learn um, from Kai T about the experience of being a Native American living downstream of a big nuclear weapons production site and all the radioactive waste and the illness in his community that came along with that. He was um, very inspiring to the young people in the Mescalero tribe um, and just a wonderful um, student of the environment. Um, and on the right, there is um, a couple of my students and I um, do, doing a trash pickup. Um, that's my dog, Banjo. He moved to New Mexico with me, too. Um, so um, at that time, I, I took a trip to Albuquerque, the big city of that state, and um, I was on one of my trainings for the AmeriCorps program. And I was wandering around the city um, one evening. I stopped in a local bookstore and I picked up a magazine that caught my eye. It was called Orion. Um, and on the front, it had a headline that said, should nature have rights? Um, that really caught my eye. And I flipped it over and on the back was an ad for um, an environmental writing workshop in Vermont. Um, and the deadline had already passed to apply for that. Um, it was like a week past the deadline, but I, I went ahead, I applied anyway. And um, yeah, I just felt this tug that it was something that I wanted to do. Um, and I got in. Um, so I went to Vermont for the workshop, and I ended up with a teacher named Janice Ray, who, um, Dr. Vic, um, and sorry, these pictures are stretched out, I think, so we look a little funny. We look a little stretched. But um, this is Janice. Um, I met there. Um, she, she, um, she was the teacher of the workshop um, who I had randomly ended up with. It turned out that Janice um, was a very well-known writer here in Georgia. Um, she had a lot of recognition for her book, Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, that interweaves her personal story of growing up on a junkyard with the history of the deforestation of the longleaf pine forests in the southern coastal plains. Um, and while I was there for that very brief time, it was only about three days, um, Janice really encouraged my voice. And uh, it, uh, it brings me um, emotion to think about that, just how one person can really encourage that. Um, I was able to witness her this, uh, <laughs> you know, she's a very powerfully spoken um, woman who has dedicated her life to writing about our relationship with the natural world. Um, and so I felt a glimmer, just a little glimmer of um, what I wanted to do. And that was in 2008. Um, I also have a distinct memory of sitting there listening um, at the workshop to another writer reading their work. And 
um, just thinking I'll never be there. I'll never get that far. Um, so I, I just still didn't really believe or really get it that um, this was what I wanted to do and what I was doing. Um, I finished my year-long position at AmeriCorps, and after that I was in a long period of just not knowing. And all the while, still living in New Mexico, um, I was trying to get out as much as I could, learn from people and the environment, about the environment, um, about ecology, and energy rights, um, sorry, energy issues, land rights, um, food and agriculture. Um, I went to work on an organic farm um, in northern New Mexico. And I just wanted to really be out as much as I could learning and talking to people. And I always took my notebook and I was always writing. And I sort of, um, you know, I just thought I wasn't doing anything with my life. Um, and I think in large part, I just hadn't really seen that path modeled um, enough for me. I think that um, also societally, um, I just hadn't seen much of the, you know, the path of the artist and, or, or the path of people really called to work with the environment and for nature. Um, so um, I, just, I just emphasize that I'm only able to really see this path in retrospect, um, that I was making my way into this work and doing um, what I, exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I took another internship in Silver City, New Mexico, another remote um, rural desert town in the southwestern part of that state with the Center for Biological Diversity who works on endangered uh, species policy. And I was learning intensively about the politics and land rights issues surrounding the Mexican gray wolf. That's North America's most endangered mammal. Um, which the Center for Biological Diversity was advocating for at that time. And I rode around on national forest land, observing grazing patterns on the public leases for cattle grazing, um, looking for wolf tracks and just soaking up that um, place. It's a huge expansive tract of national forest land um, with the Gila River running through it. On the left there, um, the cottonwood trees that you see, um, that's the telltale sign of a desert habitat uh, river. Um, so the river ran through that, um, that place. Um, and I was researching the history of the wolf there and the history that's a funny picture of me. Um, my boyfriend took, he was, um, I, he was supportive and um, on this journey with me. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, I was researching the history of the wolf and the history of the ancient cultures there, um, especially the Mogollon culture who um, had cliff dwellings there above the river. Uh, that's a picture of a hawk above, um, above the river there on a cliff. Um, and I was doing education and outreach about the wolf as well. Uh, the wolf was highly politicized there. It was actually dangerous work. Um, a Sierra Club worker was shot there in the 1970s while doing wolf advocacy. Um, anyway, we, um, we were just camping around. I was so happy and excited to be immersed in that place, in such a beautiful place. And I began to study top predator ecology uh, very deeply and began to read the work of Aldo Leopold, whose book, A Sand County Almanac, um, had always been on the shelf of my childhood home growing up, um, those first 19 years that I omitted from the story. Um, my mother studied forestry. So um, Leopold was profoundly influential in deepening the practices of public land management forestry and conservation in this country in the 40s, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, and the Gila forest was actually the place where he shot a wolf, um, which later became a famous scene in his book where he begins to think about top predator ecology um, in his essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, which um, was also the development of the famous uh, land ethic. 
Um, so I can, I can look back now and see that I was really apprenticing to Leopold, the environmental writer in that place um, in many ways, and that this was my first major effort at writing the environment um, through research, reporting, and immersion. Um, even though at that time, again, I, would, I thought I was just bumming, bumming around, having a good time, because um, that was very enjoyable to me, very fulfilling. Um, I wrote a long chronicle of my time there, a piece that has never been published, and it probably won't be, but um, maybe one day. Um, and I can see that I was beginning to find my way into the practice of this work, um, in the Gila National Forest of Southwestern New Mexico, and that I was trying out my voice as a writer. Um, so I just, I share uh, this part of the story um, to, um, it's just a reminder to all of us and to me to pay attention to where your passion is taking you, um, where your attention is being pulled, um, because that's probably uh, how you can give your best gifts to the world, and it's probably what you want to be doing. Um, so a big break for me came when I applied for and received a reporting fellowship, and um, that was the Middlebury Fellowship in Environmental Journalism. The fellowship gave me $10,000 to go report a story, um, which I very much needed uh, that support. Um, and it was a story I pitched to them about 4 million tons of coal ash that was shipped uh, from a coal ash spill at a coal plant in Tennessee, where I was from, to the Black Belt of Alabama. Um, so back in the South, I spent a year working on that story. And then I got to go workshop it in Big Sur, California, um, uh, with Bill McKibben and Rebecca Solnit, who are both... Um, environmental writers of great renown. Um, I respect their work uh, so much. Um, that's a picture of me just soaking up everything they're saying. That's Bill there on the left and Rebecca there next to me on the right. They became um, supportive of my path and it was so important to me um, to witness their work as well. Um, so, um, so after that, um, sort of long, uh, short story of origin. Um, I, um, I've been plodding along steadily ever since, um, writing stories. Um, my piece that I wrote for the fellowship came out as a feature in the Oxford American Magazine. Um, and since then I've written um, in-depth feature stories in many unique landscapes and habitats. Um, in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, I wrote a long, sprawling feature story about walking one of the city's urban waterways from its headwaters uh, to the mouth of the Tennessee River. Um, that was a, a very loving tribute for me to my this city that I love and that I have a deep uh, ancestry in. Um, I, uh, I've also worked and written in, um, and what and what I'm saying now won't necessarily necessarily align with the uh, with the stories on the slides. Um, but I've I've also worked um, since then and written in the Guadalupe Mountains of West Texas, um, writing about an ancient fossil reef and gas drilling um, on the Big Island of Hawaii, um, writing about the ancient indigenous Hawaiian practices of star navigation and canoe building. Um, I've written on the U.S.-Mexico border about the uh, Rio Grande River, which forms the border there. Uh, I've written about mushroom foraging in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Um, I've reported in coal country in eastern Kentucky. Oh, that one aligned. Um, that's that story. Um, written about root diggers and herbal medicine in the coal fields of East Tennessee on the Cumberland Plateau. Um, I have written throughout the Tennessee River watershed about freshwater mussels and the um, incredible freshwater diversity there. Um, here in the Southeast, by the way, um, we have the, it's the world hotspot of aquatic uh, biological diversity, fish and 
um, freshwater mussels, which I got really uh, obsessed with. Um, uh, I wrote in uh, coastal Maine about uh, sailing and seaweed aqu aquaculture. Um, and I've just been lucky to, um, to spend time in places and, um, and absorb, absorb them as much as I possibly can, um, even as a, as a visitor um, and as a traveler. So um, I, um, I also went on to earn an MFA in creative writing, um, with, and I really took the time to dive into the craft of writing. Um, this is um, my friends helping me get dressed because writers need help getting dressed sometimes. Um, that's supposed to be a joke. Um, yeah, so, uh, and I also became a certified Southern Appalachian naturalist at the Tremont Institute in the Great Smoky Mountains where I'm from. Um, I got to study animal tracking uh, with Wanda DeWard. She's a well-known mammal tracker. She mostly tracks black bears, but she's really brilliant at tracking all animals. Um, that's her there on the left, um, just inspiring, uh, inspiring people. There on the right, um, I was studying aquatic wildlife and stream ecology. Um, I took classes on plants and trees, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and um, just took all of my knowledge so much deeper, um, which really just set me up to become a lifelong learner. Um, the certification gave me the skills to keep taking my knowledge farther. Um, so, um, okay, so here I am today, um, and let's <laughs> let's get into this. Okay, so. What is environmental writing? Um, so environmental writing to me is on a, a wide, wide spectrum of voices and styles, but something that all of it has in common, I think, is an entanglement with a lot of other disciplines and fields of study. So I sort of just did a brainstorm about what I thought these were, and maybe this is mostly where my interests entangle um, and I think it's definitely even, even broader than this. Um, but some of these are history, sociology, politics and policy, geography, ecology, psychology, botany, forestry, biology, zoology, mycology, ornithology, entomology. And just to pause there, um, the writer Richard Powers, who wrote The Overstory, um, which won the National Book Award um, a few years ago, he, he calls those the humbling sciences. And I, I love that term. Um, I think uh, an older term, we call them as the life sciences. Um, and of course, it's also deeply entangle, entangled with uh, language and literature. Uh, the humanities and philosophy. Um, so, so diving into um, sort of the tools and practices that I thought I could share with you all today, um, I, I sort of thought of uh, these in three basic main categories, research, reporting, and immersion. Um, so, Let's see, sorry, I'm checking the time, making sure we're good. Okay, so, um, and, this is, and this is not even including sort of the craft of writing itself, um, but um, these are some broad categories that I think of as uh, sort of the practice and the foundation of the work. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to give you a few techniques within each category that you can pick up and use for yourself. Um, so this is in no way comprehensive. Um, it's just sort of a starter kit maybe. Um, and as we walk through this, I thought it would be helpful to take the Georgia Piedmont um, as our example, as if, we're, as if we're researching, reporting on, and immersing in this region. Um, but through this example, we can identify categories of tools um, that you can use in any place. So 
Um, so just as a starting thought, um, I say the Georgia Piedmont and not just Athens because that's the name of the physio-geographic region here. Um, so it already begins to describe the area geographically. Um, also, just to pause, that's the U.S.-Mexico border in the picture. I'm sorry, I didn't say that, but that's the um, river that forms the border there. Um, so um, anyway, uh, so we're in the Piedmont. We're in the Georgia Piedmont. Um, Piedmont is French for foot of the mountains as you may know. Um, so with that, let's uh, sort of segue into some of these research tools that I um, thought of. So um, first I just, um, I'm gonna pull up, we're gonna do some links. So um, the Georgia Museum of Natural History has this um, little uh, page about the physiogeographic regions of Georgia. Um, so I thought that would just be a good sort of introductory page to um, put our eyes on. We can see the, um, the regions there that separate the state. Um, and physiogeographic refers to the soil types, the geology. Um, yeah, mostly that, soil type and, and geology. Um, and it, it can tell us a lot about a place. It can tell us a lot about habitat. Um, Let's see if I can toggle here. Sorry, this is, okay. Okay, so, um, so we can see here um, as, if we're, as if we're beginning to research the Georgia Piedmont, we can start to just think broadly about this place. What is it? Um, the Piedmont province contains a series of rolling hills and occasional isolated mountains rivers and ravines. Um, the, this is an area of oak hickory pine forest and mixed deciduous forest, um, et cetera. Um, oak hickory pine forests are the most widespread type of forest in the southeastern US. Um, and they cover the entire Piedmont from Virginia south to Alabama and west to Texas. The dominant trees include oaks and hickories, shortleaf pine, loblolly pine. Um, so. Um, this is sort of, um, you know, obviously we're staying really general here, um, but uh, this is, might be the type of research I would be doing if I don't really have a story yet, um, but I know I want to write about a certain place. Um, and stories don't always happen that way. Um, I often sort of know an issue um, or an animal or a plant or a person or something that I want to write about. Um, and then I begin to research its larger context. Um, but this is also just a cool way to explore and think about what kinds of stories might be written in a particular region or place. Um, so I just want to keep that in mind as um, I speed up and keep going through some of these links and websites. Um, just, I saw so many stories jumping out at me, just so many paths that could be taken in writing about a single place. It's, um, it's really endless. Um, so, um, okay, so back to the PowerPoint here. Um, okay, so Museums of Natural History, those are great kind of websites to check out. Public lands websites. Um, so we're gonna look here at um, a few sort of agencies, public land agencies, and we'll start with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I just found this Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge, which I didn't know about. Um, oh, it's asking the server if we can do that. I hope we can. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so here, um, Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge. Um, let's see, what did I look at on this page? Um, I think... It was sort of, yeah, so it, um, I found this story, this history um, that um, it was, it was a, a land that needed um, rehabilitated, um, the, which, you know, does describe much of the Piedmont um, after this extreme deforestation, um, uh, 
the massive erosion problems, the boll weevil decimation of cotton crops, um, et cetera. Just this history of um, the land here in the Piedmont um, becoming um, very impoverished, we might say. Um, and that this place, the, the wildlife refuge, um, it's a story of restoration, um, which I, you know, in itself, I just thought, wow, this is a, an amazing story. Um, they rehabilitated um, this land that's 35,000 acre wildlife refuge. It's again, um, a, a forest, um, et cetera. It's also a habitat uh, for the endangered, well, um, I saw it before, but it's a, it's a habitat for um, the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. It's um, one of its main sort of recovery areas. Um, so anyway, um, these are just, so again, I'm trying to be, um, I'm trying to be both like both um, specific and general. So, um, so just, okay, Fish and Wildlife Service website, um, sort of uh, familiarizing yourself with public land um, management agencies. Um, Fish and Wildlife Agency is a government agency within the Department of Interior. It enforces uh, federal wildlife laws, protects endangered species, manages migratory birds, restores, restores fisheries, conserves and restores wildlife habitat like wetlands. Um, there are 560 national wildlife refuges all across the 50 US states, um, et cetera. You can see a lot of information here. Um, but as you're researching, if you decide to dive into researching any place, um, the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, might be a great source. So here are some other public land management agencies, Forest Service, National Park Service, and for the Western states, the Bureau of Land Management. I'm gonna speed up a bit, um, and, uh, but just sort of touch on some of these things. Um, so for example, the Forest Service, you know, Chattahoo Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest we have here, um, <clears throat> um, that is almost a million acres. Um, a lot of that is here in the, in the Piedmont, um, the Oconee National Forest, um, so there's so much, so much um, valuable information. The, so one thing the public land management agencies do really well um, is uh, collect, collect information and, um, and uh, educational materials. There, on all of these sites, there's a whole lot that you can learn and um, find out about. Um, as you research places. Um, the National Park Service, of course, um, manages all the national parks. That's around 85 million acres in the US. Um, and I don't know if you've been following the Okmulgee Mounds uh, National Historic Park. Um, that's a really interesting story uh, that takes place partly in the Piedmont. I found um, by uh, just reading this site, there is so much information on this site um, that um, the, there at the mounds, at the Okmulgee Mounds, um, where the creek, um, the Okmulgee Creek people um, had a lot of their ceremonies, um, and before them, again, the mound builders. Um, that is the, uh, right there is the fall line of Georgia where the Piedmont becomes the coastal plain. Uh, just really fascinating, um, fascinating region. Um, here I learned um, this archeology span dig there in the 1930s. It's the largest archeology span dig in the nation that has ever um, been conducted um, and right here. Um, near us. Um, so this is just sort of to illustrate um, when you're, you know, diving into research that the public land management agencies are great places to look for stories, to um, think about the region, um, think about the land and its histories. Um, 
in the Western states, the Bureau of Land Management um, manages 700 million acres of subsurface mineral estate. Um, so these are just sort of for example. Um, the EPA, just to touch on this as a research tool, um, again, if you, well, if you get really into uh, environmental reporting, um, you, you, um, you might be writing about like how the EPA fails to uh, enforce their regulations, um, but they're very good at uh, collecting um, information and um, making that information available. Um, EPA website is incredible. I've uh, gotten so much valuable, um, valuable information um, and done a lot of research um, just with information available uh, from the EPA. Just I just was Googling around um, or searching around on the site um, when I was putting this together. You know, you can just search where you are um, and pulls up, you know, um, so there's 90,000 results uh, for Georgia EPA. Um, just randomly um, clicked on this Covington, Georgia facility um, that with, and they put all this information together about the ethylene oxide emissions there, can learn what ethylene oxide is. Um, if you get into sort of, this is sort of a research um, a branch of research if you do get more into writing about policy, um, politics, pollution, um, water quality, uh, air quality, that sort of thing. So, of course, the EPA um, deals with pollutants, industry waste, emissions, air quality, drinking water. They are in charge of all the drinking water sources in the U.S., Superfund sites. Um, it, Effluent gu guidelines, um, etc. Um, so, okay. So then, conservation groups and nonprofits are also a great place to uh, do your research. So, just for example, Georgia Conservancy um, has a really incredible website. Tons of educational information there. Um, and sorry that I I do feel I want to speed up because I want to leave time for Q and A. Um, so, Wikipedia, we all know it's a great starting point, and we all use it. Um, you, you look for the sources there. There's great um, listings of the sources. So, just for example, the Okmulgee Mounds Park, um, you know, tons of information, great starting point. You can get articles, names of, names of articles. Further reading is sometimes helpful um, there. Um, and library databases. So I do want to spend about five minutes just to show you all the library databases that are incredibly helpful. Um, here at the UGA Libraries, of course, you have access to all of that. Um, so the databases here, A to Z, I will just go straight to my favorite one. I am a JSTOR fanatic. <laughs> I use it all the time. Um, so. Um, JSTOR is just a database that collects um, articles across, uh, across journals, thousands of humanities and sciences journals. Um, so you can see the sorts of results that you'll get. Um, you can see the range of, um, the range of um, dates here and um, the range of topics. Um, it's, it's an incredible resource and I use it all the time. So um, there are a few more, um, I'll skip, I'll just um, pull up quickly just this first result. Um, yeah, it, um, and you can just get right in to a lot of interesting stuff. I spend days and days on research just um, following, <laughs> following um, in my impulses and intuitions, um, which is something that I encourage when you're research researching. Um, 
So some other library databases I have listed out here. Um, I think the PowerPoint will be will be available to you all who are in the certificate program, um, and you can look at some of these other databases: um, agricultural, agricultural and environmental science, etc. Um, I'm going to skip over some of those. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, you can, of course, visit in person the um, library archives and museum collections. That's a wonderful, um, very rich and fulfilling thing to do just to have your hands on um, things in person. Um, the Natural History Museum here has these um, wonderful collections. Um, there are, uh, I think, 11 um, major collections in the museum, and you can sort of see here um, if you start, you know, if you start digging into any kind of um, species, um, you're going to find a whole lot of specimens in the museum. You can touch them, look at them. They're from all across the southeast. Um, it's a really interesting way to think about um, to think about species um, and to, to get very close to them. Um, so, and the library again, I'll leave this link for you. Um, there is a rare book library here at the university with um, great materials. Um, just for example, I pulled up a um, historical William Bartram book. Bartram was a big uh, explorer here in this region. Um, so, okay, I'm going to speed up even more. Um, so field guides are incredible for um, research, and the more specific, I would say, is often the better, the more specific that you can get. Um, so here you'll see sort of some that I use in this region. I'm currently deep into the Fern Guide and other pteridophytes of Georgia. Um, I'll also say the UGA Press. So read, just reading histories of places, landscapes. Um, uh, just for this region, um, UGA Press has an incredible environmental history and the American South series. Tons of amazing uh, histories here. Um, so, um, yeah, think of histories you can look at, field guides. So my main tips for researching, stay open, follow the threads that are interesting to you. Like I'm always very open on what I'm writing about, so follow the thread that feels really golden to you. Um, explore wi widely. Um, and while you're researching, you can look for immersion um, and reporting opportunities, like who to talk to and where to go. So um, reporting, which is AKA talking to people, that's all it is. Um, this is, so uh, I will say it's, it, reporting is an art and a skill that has taken me many, many years to um, really, um, to, to, to really hone. And um, I love it. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, just think of it that way, just talking to people, reaching out to people, um, explain your interest and your affiliation, and tell them why their knowledge and expertise would be helpful to you. Um, and do all the research you can on them beforehand. Um, this really helps them see that you're really interested. Um, and when you, yeah, when you go to interview them, they really appreciate that. That you, that you know about their work and what they're doing. Um, so I would say this is my main reporting tip and what I really would emphasize within the reporting category um, is ask to meet them in person if it's at all possible. If at all possible, you wanna be in the place where they are and the place that you're writing about. Um, so think of a location where they can show you things or you can see them in action um, in their work um, and make them come alive. Let them come alive by allowing them to be in the place that they feel alive. So I had an example here, um, the Forester of the Year. This was a story that I just, I just found in the Athens Banner Herald. Um, 
So um, I, in the story, um, and, and no offense to the Athens Banner Herald, by the way, um, you know, it's, it's a daily newspaper and um, it has tight deadlines, but um, they, you know, they don't go out into the field with him and into the forest and just get him looking at trees, talking about trees. So that's what I would do if I were interviewing a forester. I would absolutely just get them into the forest and um, get out there with them, follow them around, see what they're doing. You want to be just absorbing them and what they do, picking up on um, picking up on their um, their character. Um, ask them personal questions and try to go deeper. Um, and uh, the last note here is just um, you can use a voice memo app or a voice recorder. Um, and then use your notebook um, when you're reporting like a camera. So um, your notebook, I brought this little um, pocket notebook. I take it everywhere because you might, you might have a chance to talk to someone at any time um, if you do uh, get into writing and become a writer. Um, and so anyway, um, you'll want to just be you know, writing about them again in that place, um, trying to describe um, them and pay attention. If you ever read John McPhee, um, he is so wonderful with his characters and it's a beautiful thing to read. Um, so I'm actually always trying to get better at this and remind myself um, just to, um, you know, to uh, honor them um, and their work. Um, and and really get that into the into the writing. And so um, immersion, aka just being there. Um, so orient yourself. Um, so you know wherever you are, say you're here in the Piedmont, um, look at maps. Maps is one of my favorite ways to really absorb and think about where I am and orient. Um, myself as much as possible in relation to the geography. Um, I have some questions here to ask. Again, I'll leave you all with some of these um, so that you can sort of, you know, think of this as a sort of a worksheet um, that you could use. Um, so like, where's the closest river, um, the closest creek? What watershed am I in? Um, so we're in the Coney River watershed. Um, that meets with the Okmulgee River um, uh, and becomes the Altima Ha and flows into the Atlantic. Um, so it's, you know, it's a great thing to know what watershed you're in. Um, what's this bioregion called? How do I describe it? Um, are there other unique geographical formations? Um, so these are the sorts of things to be thinking about. So lastly, um, just thinking about how I immerse and I've said, you know, my main tool, and it, yeah, it's your main tool. Carry your notebook and take notes as much as possible. Also, if you use your phone for voice memos, a lot of times when I'm on a reporting trip, um, I because I'm going from one place to another and I'm meeting people and working, um, I, uh, I, I talk voice memos. I basically try to write into my phone, just talk out, talk out the piece. Um, and we have now that great thing of voice to uh, voice to tech, uh, to text um, that. Um, so I, I do use that. Um, and but also the paper, the paper notebook with pen. Um, there's a lot of sort of writing prompts that I would give myself in any particular place um, that I'm writing about. If I'm on assignment, if I'm on a reporting trip, um, I try to do prompts like these for myself. Um, you never know how it will weave into your story and what you're writing about. Um, so just write, write, write. Um, the, and I consider, you know, I consider my pen and paper my number one tool. Um, just makes me stop and makes me observe. Um, so what are the people doing and talking about? What are the birds? What birds do I hear? Um, what are those plants? If I can't name them, can I describe them? 
You might also have your field guide with you. Um, so that could be a, another opportunity there. Um, what's the weather like? Are there bugs here? <laughs> um, and then you can always do the five senses exercise, which is amazing how much deeper it does take you. It's so simple. Um, and just unexpected observations always, always come up um, with, that, with that writing prompt. Um, and then um, this is one that I really like. Just imagine this place at a different time of year and just imagine what it's like then. Um, you can sort of start to think of places uh, over the time, over longer periods of time that way. Think about weather and climate um, with that. So my last um, tips, be open to things that don't seem to pertain to what you're writing. I love this tip and it's one of my main modes of working. Pretty much anything can catch my attention. I want to be that open um, because in a lot of my stories, um, it's often on the periphery, uh, things on the periphery come into the story that, um, that I didn't imagine would be tied um, and connected. So it is very surprising, um, you know, the ways that you can draw unexpected and rich connections in your writing with this. Uh, and it's also what makes your voice unique. It's what makes you um, the, it, it, it makes you the unique person writing that story because you're gonna see and notice things that uh, someone else doesn't. Um, so that makes it yours and it makes it personal. Um, if you're reporting and researching elsewhere, again, just don't forget to, um, yeah, try to take a walk at different times of the day with your journal. Um, and again, try to talk to everyone you can and ask them questions, even if they're not someone you know who you're interviewing. Um, you can really pick up a lot about a place that way. And remember that you are there, you. Um, so write about that experience and what it feels like. <laughs> so that was a long talk and I would love to hear questions. Christina. <laughs> Ooh, okay, sure. So yeah, my book um, is called A Field Guide to Listening. Um, I sort of feel like I combined, I finally sort of circled somehow back to being a music writer. Um, I'm writing about sound in nature um, and acoustic ecology, um, sounds of the natural world. Uh, the, the first reporting trip that I took for that, uh, I went to rural Connecticut and I took a walk with a guy um, in a meadow <laughs> in rural Connecticut um, uh, who he, um, he recognizes insect calls by, by sound. Um, so he can identify, you know, there are, so crickets, there's not just like one cricket. There's a whole lot of species of crickets and they all have a different song and um, they've developed those songs over millennia, millions of years. Um, and none of them, so they all sing at a certain pitch that they, none of them overlaps the other. Um, so, you know, I went and I walked in a meadow in the dark and took notes, scribbling notes with my headlamp. Um, and on with, you know, just writing about this guy who completely geeks out on the sound of crickets. <laughs> um, and yeah, <laughs> is that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was sort of my, um, my main reporting trip for my first chapter about uh, listening to crickets, which is gonna get into uh, a lot of stuff about what crickets uh, are to us. Yeah, thanks for that question. I have a question. Yeah. So the, your publications are so diverse in terms of the, the publication, you know, the, the, the publisher. And I'm wondering at what stage in the process of writing do you 
know who, where that publication is going? And do you know in advance, or do you finish the piece and shop it around? How, how does that work? Yeah, so it has worked in different ways for me. Um, there, there are a few ways it can work. You know, you can, you can do your own travels or maybe you're traveling already, um, which I have done a fair amount of. Like, um, I don't love to just vacation and do nothing. So as soon as I go somewhere, I'm like, what can I write about? Um, so, I, uh, so it has worked that way where I go to a place, I start writing about it, and then I you know, might formulate a story um, and then pitch it. Um, and then maybe get an assignment with a magazine um, and and really flesh it out and go deeper. Um, and a lot of times it also works this other way where I just, um, I don't know, I just um, get sort of interested in a place. Um, like I'm currently uh, really, really interested in the Pribilof Islands off the coast of Alaska. Um, they are the home of they're the nesting grounds of 80% of North American uh, seabirds, um, and um, et cetera. They're, they're, I've just been just researching like crazy. Uh, I don't know why sometimes that I get interested, but I have pitched that story around, so I'm sort of trying to get an assignment to go there because that's a story that I really need support for. Um, I can't fund that travel uh, for myself, so a lot of it sort of does have to do with, you know, getting the support for it. Yeah, yeah. Do you, get, do you usually get really personal with your voice when you're actually writing, or does it usually take more like action of tone? Like, how do you set the type of tone you're writing for each piece? Yeah, I think I'm always navigating that, and I'm I'm really interested to navigate that. Um, it always is something that really, really engages me in the creative process, just balancing. Um, I do heavy research. Um, I do heavy sort of science writing, um, but I am also very interested in the personal voice, and I, I always try to be in the story. Yeah, I, I do believe in that subjectivity. Um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it has been really a journey for me, um, just navigating that and thinking about how much um, that I want to allow myself to be in the story. Um, yeah, there, there's sort of, there's a lot to say there, but, um, you know, I think, I, I think that when I broke away from, actually, music writing um, is very journalistic, like you're never... I don't know. I don't want to make any statements that aren't true. Um, well, just my background, um, starting at a daily newspaper, um, and because I, I worked at a daily for five years. Um, so really being immersed in sort of the journalistic, you know, principles um, of objectivity from the beginning, I had to really work to, to allow myself a voice um, and to... Um, to, to let myself be in the stories. Yeah, yeah. I think I could say a lot more about that. I'm just. <laughs> yeah, I graduated from Brady, so that's something that like, I. Yeah, a lot. yeah, uh huh. And I do that because as a reader, I love, you know, I love it when there's a voice there and there's a person that I'm with. Um, so, yeah, love that as a reader. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah. Sure. Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, do you sometimes consider yourself or any work you read as an outsider to a culturally significant topic or environment? And then how do you approach that? Okay, yeah. So I'm hearing cultural difference. Uh, yeah, as an outsider. So yeah. Like right. Right. Yeah, especially as a white, you know, person, um, I have um, written about, um, I have, um, you know, 
people have trusted me with stories of colonization, how it has affected their cultures, um, that sort of thing. I would say that, um, you know, that with journalism, so I am always doing this dance with journalism and with personal, again, it sort of ties back into that, um, you know, as a journalist, you do um, hold and honor their story. You want to, um, you know, you want to respect their story and amplify it. Um, so I think that journalism has a really great tradition of that. It also has a really crappy tradition of that. Like, <laughs> um, but uh, journalism has really grown. Um, you know, long form journalism in the past several decades that um, I feel that, you know, I have learned a lot from reading um, those types of stories that, um, you know, so I would say personally for me, I just um, try to be human with them and try to hear their story, um, try to acknowledge um, that I am an outsider and thank them for trusting me with their story. Um, it even applies, you know, in the coal fields of Eastern Kentucky, um, where I did sort of my last, um, my most recent pretty in-depth reported story. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I just think that if you hold it in a, in a humane way and, um, acknowledge that you're thankful for their for their story for sharing it yeah it is definitely yeah something to navigate yeah oh if you already know it's your goal go for it, <laughs> go after it and just uh, own it and, um, and uh, honor it and just, yeah, honor it, I would say, because um, it's just a, it's a path that needs to be honored and, um, and just dive as deeply as you can, um, yeah. Right at time, so I think why don't we give a big thank you and welcome.